to the ESPN FC studios alongside Casey Kelly, Stuart Robson. I'm Sebastian Salazar. Lots to get into in this show. The latest on the futures of Alexis Sanchez, the latest on the future of Pierre Emerick Obama Yang. But we got to start with the biggest story of them all Neymar potentially moving from Barcelona to PSG. Let's see what the Spanish papers are saying. Sport, PSG going after Neymar. Marca pointing out the release clause it would take to get the deal done. And how about IS? Ah, Neymar flirting with PSG. Let's call on our man Julian Laurent. He has the latest on this. Julian, there's a report coming out of Brazil that says Neymar has indeed accepted PSG's offer. You buying it? No. No, Neymar hasn't accepted anything because there hasn't been any offer from PSG yet. What's true, though, is that the door was reopened. For PSG, and I'll take you back a year ago, at this time more or less, where Neymar's dad, Neymar, and the PSG hierarchy, especially Nasser El Khalifi, the PSG chairman, were talking. PSG thought at the time a year ago that Neymar could come to Paris, and in the end, they felt used because Neymar got a new improved deal at Barcelona. So right now, PSG are very cautious, not getting carried away at all, remembering of last year, but thinking, OK, it seems that the door was reopened. It seems that Neymar is not so happy at Barcelona. Messi has renewed his contract, which means that Neymar is going to play second fiddle again for another three to four years. It seems there's tension between Neymar's dad and the, the directors at Barcelona as well. And it seems that maybe PSG has a chance. Money is no problem for them. They can pay anything they want, the transfer fee, the salary, everything. And in Paris, Neymar has one of his best friends in Dani Alves, has Maxwell as well, who is now uh, the assistant sporting director at the club. Again, Maxwell and Neymar and Neymar's dad are very close too. So there's a lot of positives in there for Paris. But yeah, this is a, there's a long way to go. This is a huge transfer. Probably it would be the biggest transfer of all time, obviously. And it's not a transfer that you do like that in two days. Julian, as a PSG fan, how excited would you be to see Neymar land in Paris? Please, please come to Paris. I mean, I mean it would be amazing, but I'm a bit like my club. I'm not getting carried away. Uh, this is a dream, though, for PSG. You know, since ever the Qatari took over a few years back and brought all those millions into the club, the dream was one of the three, either Messi, Ronaldo or Neymar. They've tried all of them, basically. Neymar was always the closest to come to Paris, and we mentioned it, especially last summer, even the summer before that as well. Now it seems that maybe they've got another go at it, maybe they've got another chance. And I think for every PSG fan all over the world, it would be incredible. And you know what's funny, though? is PSG just announced their away kit. And this year, the away kit is all yellow in tribute to all the great Brazilian players that PSG have had through the years. Rai, Leonardo, uh, Valdo, obviously in recent years as well with Marquinhos and Chago Silva and all of the... Imagine, imagine if Neymar, the year where the yellow shirt is the PSG away shirt, imagine if Neymar was signing. All right, gentlemen, we discussed this at length in yesterday's show, but does this report out of Brazil maybe in any way change your mind about the realistic nature of these possibilities? Uh, in some ways, yes, but I've changed my mind whether it's a good move for Neymar and whether it's a good move for Barcelona on PSG. I would say, if I was a Barcel at Barcelona now, let him go. Uh, really? You know, if he wants to play second, he's going to be second fiddle to Messi. We've signed him on. I'm not sure he's the outstanding player that people think he is. He's a very, very good player. But if you get offered that sort of money, I think they should take it, Barcelona, and move on. Cash in 20, 222 mm. million and, and, and have a, a war chest to build. Mm. Absolutely. A team that can then really go back and dominate like they did four or five if seasons ago. every year ago. he wants to flirt with another club, let him go. Let him go and play, play his football yeah, somewhere you, else. You did it last year. You mm. got yourself a great new contract. Mm. And you're still not content? Mm. Ah, you're right. I agree with you. But Absolutely. guys, they're playing catch-up with Real Madrid. They can't possibly let one of their best players go. But if they're getting £222 million... As Casey just said, you can then start going and bringing other players in. You might, um, it's not, I know there's not a lot of time. So do the deal now. Get it done and dusted so you can bring in new players. Let's get uh, Julien's perspective on this. Would Barcelona be crazy to let Neymar go? Well, I, I, I'm not sure who could replace him. That's the thing. I get, I get the boys' point and I understand and I, and, and I agree in some extent to it. But, you know, who would come in? to play in that front three at Barcelona. Who could do a deal that, you know, a job that Neymar was doing, which, you know, would be happy by being Messi's second fiddle, as we said, with those stats as well. I mean, just look at the stats. And I know it's probably easier in many ways to score and to assist when you are Barcelona. But still, if you can name me one or two, maybe three players who could do that job, you know, who is as good as Neymar, that can Barcelona can go by now, then I believe you.
What, what, Julian, what about Alexis Sanchez? Gone back. Going back to Barcelona. <laughs> There's a player that's unhappy at Arsenal. Why not get him? There's a player that could do the job, I think. He's... I'm not sure. I'm not sure he could do that job. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think, I think if, if you play there, you have to be very unselfish. And in many ways, Neymar has been selfish in, in, in the way he plays sometimes, but also very unselfish to Messi and to Suarez and to the rest of the team. Alexis is, by definition, one of the most selfish players that you can find in world football. I, I, I get your point, Stu, and, and, and I agree with it in many ways. I just think it's hard to replace mm. someone like Neymar. Even with 200 million euros, it's really hard to go and find someone who would hit the ground running straight away and give you those stats. Julian, what about Alexis Sanchez to PSG? This is the cover of L'Equipe, is this any more realistic of a possibility than Neymar to Paris? Oh, yeah, 100%. And they were working on, on Alexis again before the whole Neymar saga thing started again. But, you know, a month ago, a month and a half ago, they were leading the race with Bayern Munich for Alexis. The problem was always the money that Alexis was asking was just crazy. And I think PSG at that time said, hang on, we, you know, even, even us, we can't pay that. Otherwise, our dressing room is going to implode if we bring Alexis on that kind of money. It seems that Alexis had, you know, um, decreased a bit the, the money that he wanted, the salary that he wanted, and that is far more doable for PSG to not make the dressing room crazy if Alexis signs. So also, I think on Alexis' sign, it seems that PSG are the last club that can sign him because Bayern Munich have moved on, Juventus have moved on. It's quite clear that Arsenal are not going to sell either to City or to Chelsea. So who's left is PSG, and they need someone like him as well. You know, whether they get Neymar or not, it's a different story. But they need someone like Sanchez who could play wide, who could also play as a centre-forward when Cavani is not on the, pit, on the pitch, for example. So it makes a lot of sense for PSG if the money is OK for them and if Alexis is not crazy with what he was wanted. Stuart, can Arsenal truly afford to let Alexis Sanchez go here? Uh, in terms of their playing stone, no, he was their best play, has been their best player for the last couple of years. But when somebody... And it's, there's no question about it. He doesn't want to be at Arsenal next season. He wants to play in the Champions League, as he's already said. But he's such a good player for Arsenal. It's impossible for them to get, replace him, but I think it's the right time to let him go because he's not going to be a happy player next year, and that's a problem for Arsene Wenger. Yeah, it's a big problem for Arsene Wenger. He needs to kind of have a little bit of a rebuilding mm. year, get back where Arsene Wenger is in charge mm. of that squad. Yeah. And we saw it sections of, of last season. There was a lot of turmoil within that, <laughs> that Arsenal team. And they were also setting up Alexis Sanchez. The Arsenal, the Arsenal board, the Arsenal media side were setting up, and we just heard Julian say that he's a selfish player, he doesn't work hard enough at times. And that's how Arsenal were trying to portray Alexis Sanchez when they dropped him against Liverpool and all the crowd got onto uh, Arsene Wenger. So I think it's, it's, it's in everybody's interest for Alexis Sanchez to move on. Well, and then if he doesn't move on right away, then he mm. goes away on a free transfer and then they lose. So in, in a lot of ways, I think, I agree, cash out now while you mm. can. Let's go to Julien. Bottom line, do you think that Alexis ends up staying at Arsenal? No. No, I agree with the boys. I think they can't... It doesn't make any sense for Arsenal to keep someone who wants to go, who you would force to stay and, and miss out on maybe 40 million euros because that's probably how much they would, they would want to, get to sell him for and that's probably what PSG are ready to offer Arsenal, even with just one year left on his deal. So I agree with the boys. I think it's the right time for him to go and for Arsenal it's the right time to sell as well and it would be a great addition to the PSG squad. So Alexis was supposed to move. He hasn't yet. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang was also supposed to move. He hasn't yet. Borussia Dortmund sporting director Michael Zork has said the following. We consider the transfer window closed for him because we otherwise would have run out of time to find replacements. Julien, is this true? Is the door truly closed here? I thought there was another week of wiggle room to get this deal done for Dortmund. No, of course not. Of course it's not closed because if someone comes in next week or even the week after, maybe even the week after that with 70 or 80 million euros, don't want to sell. You know, they're not that crazy. Michael Zork is amazing at his job. He's very good. And he knows exactly, he's a master of negotiating and of transfer. And he knows exactly that's the way to put a bit of pressure on the clubs who could be interested in, in Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, maybe like Milan or maybe like Inter Milan as well, or clubs like that who have the money to pay 70 or 80 million euros. And I'm sure that Dortmund and Michael Zork have already a shortlist with three players that could replace him. Then what's true is that they can't do the, the deal on the 31st of August and have no time to turn around and sign someone else. So in their interest, and also in Aubameyang's interest, if he were to go, they have to do that you know, sooner than later. But of course the door is still open if someone comes in with 70 or 80 million euros.
Casey, how do you rate Aubameyang? Because it seems as though the market is not rating him, at least now, as they were maybe a month, month and a half ago. Well, and I think that's the big question mark. The question mark is, is there's nobody coming in with the money, otherwise he'd be gone. But you, when you look at his stats, you, his stats are excellent. And, 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 that's the, and that's the tricky part is, mm. is again, two goals today as mm. well against AC Milan, one of the supposed suitors for Aubameyang. What is it? What, what is it that the big clubs are missing or what is it that we're missing when we see a player with these kind of stats in a top league on a top team? Why are... He hasn't just done it over one season. Correct. He's done it over two seasons. If I was, say, Arsene Wenger uh, a few mm. weeks ago, I would say Aubameyang is a far better player than Lacazette. I know he's going to cost more money, but if I looked at the two players, I know which player I'd want to buy, and that would be Aubameyang. From the Dortmund perspective, do you worry at all about keeping a player who was one foot out the door? For me, it depends. I think it depends if they get an offer that's close. Mm. Let's say they get an offer for 55, 60 million euros. And the player knows it. And it's one of the clubs that he really wants to go to. And they turn it down. Now you've got a problem. If the offer never comes and the player believes that the offer never came, then I think he's OK. And it's a question of his character. We talked about Alexis Sanchez. You can't keep him at Arsenal because he, he wouldn't, maybe it might be a problem for the manager. It could be the same with Aubameyang. But I think he's a better character than that. Julian, do you have any doubts about Aubameyang? No, I've got no doubts. The, the only thing is he wants to go. You know, he was desperate to go. He did everything to go this summer. And like we've said, there was no offers, or at least no offers of the amount that Dortmund are ready to let him go for. And it's interesting, he's got three more years on his contract. He's 28, though. He's just turned 28. So there's not, you know, there's not much more time for him to get that huge uh, transfer to a, a much bigger club than, than Dortmund. I think the, the problem with Dortmund he had was with Thomas Tuchel, the former manager, where there was a lot of tension there. Remember, he went away to Milan to party. Tuchel was not happy. They fined him. There was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of tension there. Tuchel is gone now, and it's probably a different story for Van Young. And maybe he might not stay at least another year and maybe see his options next summer. Well, as all this continues to shake out in the coming days, ESPNFC.com is the place to be for all your breaking news and transfer talk. Henrik Mkhitaryan enjoying Los Angeles, hanging out with Carmelo Anthony, NBA superstar and a group of Armenian kids. At the event, he sat down with our Mark Ogden to discuss his first season at Old Trafford. So when I came here first, some people were saying that I shouldn't have left Dortmund. But uh, I know what I want in my life, I know where I'm going and I know that uh, I can do better and better. And it's not like that that I've chosen uh, Manchester United because it's a very big club. I know the pressure here, I know the ambitions here and uh, that makes the will to, to come here. And um, of course I knew that it's not going to be easy, but I'm always ready for difficulties, I'm always ready to fight for my place, and I'm always ready to, to start a new life. You can catch the entirety of that interview over at ESPNFC.com. Last season for Mkhitaryan, 15 starts, just four goals for Manchester United at 30 million pounds, certainly has to do more. He's got to do more. He got off to a bad start at the start of last season. Uh, didn't convince the manager that he had the desire to, to work hard, to close people down, do both sides of the game. You know, when you're playing for Jose Mourinho, you can't flit around the field and just be a creative player. You have to defend as well. You have to be strong. You have to put tackles in. You have to work hard for the team. And he didn't do that to start with. I think he then lost confidence. He then started to have a very good period of the season, particularly in Europa League, and then fell away again a little bit at the end. So he's got to be more consistent. But where is he going to play in the team? Or has he got a place in the team? That's the, that's the question I think everybody will be asking. Is that the biggest question? What his role, what his position is? No, I think his biggest question is, is the endeavour side of it. Mm. Can he really fight his way in the Premier League the way he needs to? I think the quality is there. And oh, you absolutely. Saw, you saw moments yeah. of it in, throughout the season when, when he did things. Everyone was going, how has this guy not been mm. playing? In a team that was really lacking creativity at a lot of times, he came in and threw and that the very, And the very spot. next week, after having such a good game, you saw him play poorly and not really right. get involved. And, and that's and, where he's got to get that consistency. And that's where it has to be. No question about it. All right, for more on this, let's head to Los Angeles, where Dan Thomas and Craig Burley have been embedded with Manchester United. Thank you very much, Seb. Day three of us here in L.A. And yes, the sunglasses remain. We will be discussing them, I promise, a little later on in the show. But first, let's start with Mkhitaryan, Craig. 
So much excitement when he came over from the Bundesliga, heralded as one of the best players at Borussia Dortmund. Came in and didn't quite make the impact, did he, that we were expecting at Old Trafford? Well, he, he played in the Manchester derby at Old Trafford early in the season, got the hook at half-time. Yeah. And it was almost like his confidence was gone and he wasn't ready and he took the brunt, but it seemed for what wasn't a very good performance. Then the, the news started filtering out other rumours about he didn't have the physicality for the Premier League and all mm. that utter garbage because the guy was a star, a really good player in the Bundesliga. Now, the Bundesliga is as physical a league, if not more physical, than the Premier League. He's played at a fast pace. The guys are all strong, particularly the, the German guys because that's the way they're built up and, and that's the way they play. Uh, he played under pressure because of the big crowds. They are scrutinised in Germany yeah. as well. So it was utter nonsense. I think what we saw was a player who never quite found his feet in terms of the position he wanted to play in. His confidence was dented and yes, he lacked a bit of fitness at the start. And the big question this year, Dan, will be will Mourinho play him in that best position he has behind possibly Lukaku where he can pull the strings or will he be out wide will he be chasing full backs back and forward and this is the thing and you mentioned the fact obviously he got substituted in that game yep. he wasn't exactly supported outwardly certainly by the manager and we're used to seeing Jose Mourinho in the past defending his players you know it's yeah. us against the world yeah. did that into Milan did that at Chelsea in his yeah. first spell yeah. we didn't see that at all really last season Shaw Smalling Jones all thrown yeah, under the bus as well. It's definitely a change of emphasis in his management style. You, you mentioned it. You go to, you go to his, his successful days at Porto where he won mm -hmm. the, it was a UEFA Cup then and the Champions League. And the spirit he bonded. And in Chelsea, nobody would have said a bad word about him. He had some problems at Real Madrid, as you yeah. know, but the pressure there can be incredibly intense. And in the siege mentality uh, at Inter Milan was unbelievable. The players, players were in tears when he was leaving. He was hugging them in the tunnel after yeah. winning the Champions League. But he seems to have gone down a different route. And I think if you go around the dressing room at Man United, there's probably few players that he hasn't actually outed sure. in public. And I just wonder if that's going to continue or he's going to take a different stance this season. And it's a big season for him, obviously. It's a huge season. He's got a CV second to none. But he's following after, let's be honest, two disasters from the Ferguson area. But going back, Ferguson, as we know, well Doc, it was m magnificent. Yeah. It will hurt him if he can't take United back to somewhere close to where Ferguson had them because the papers will be waiting for him and all the people that he's been having a dig at will be waiting for him to say well you couldn't do it at Man United you couldn't do it at the big club and you couldn't do what Sir Alex Ferguson did and he'll want to make sure that is not the case Craig Burley thank you very much a lot more from Craig a little later on in the show where I'll be introducing him to a certain Kenny Powers I feel like we got to tell people who Kenny Powers is legendary American comedy figure Fictional character. Well, yeah, he means that he's a washed-up baseball player who is, as you said, a very interesting Not saying character. Craig's washed up, are we? No, no, never <laughs> never would I suggest any and, such and, thing. And, and maybe Kenny's a little fitter than Craig <laughs> at this well, point Well, we, we'll see the, the photo evidence of just how much they resemble them, uh, eat one another, uh, in just a little bit. Back to the pressing matters at hand. Antonio Conte has signed an extension uh, with Chelsea. Julian Laurence, uh, what do we make of this? Uh, some stability to what was kind of a volatile situation this summer for the defending Premier League champions. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's a good sign because it means that the tension that have been happening between Conte and, and, and some people at the club, especially over the recruitment, or this, the, how slow the recruitment was, which got him really, really frustrated. Bakayoko, especially, who took, seems forever to sign, missing out on Romelu Lukaku, obviously, as well, was another one that got Conte really frustrated. It seems that it's more peaceful now, and that's why he signed a new deal, which is not an extension, by the way, which is a brand new deal with obviously more money for, for Conte it shows that he's happier there. Everything, like I said, is more peaceful and they can start or continuing their recruitment and start on the new season in a much better way than maybe it looked like two or three weeks ago where he was really not happy. Uh, no word yet. If Antonio Conte has made the top 50 most influential people in world football, you can find the list over on ESPNFC.com. Joe Hart's sojourn abroad has come to an end. The English goalkeeper on loan to West Ham for the season. What do you think of the move, Casey? Well, I think anything for Joe Hart to try to resurrect his, his career is, is good for Joe Hart. He's going to have competition with, with Adrian if, in, in Randolph if they're mm. still uh, in the mix come the start of the season. Uh, it, it didn't work out as well for him in Torino. Conceded a lot of goals. What he would have liked, obviously the door is shut at Man City and he needs to get somewhere if he wants to 
continue to be the England number one. Stewart, is Hart good enough to start at West Ham? He is. I think he's better than Adrian. He's better than Randolph. I think he'll do a very good job there. He didn't have a great time at Torino, but I think it's a good move for him. You play every week. He still is the England number one. He's going to get a lot of uh, competition from Jordan Pickford, I think, next season. But uh, it's a good move for both West Ham and for Joe Hart. You think he should still be England's number one? You're number one until somebody takes the job away from you, and that's really what it comes down to. And, and uh, you know, coaches aren't necessarily worried. They just want good quality players in the positions they're playing in. And, and, if, and if Joe right now, I, mean, I, I, I agree with Stewart, I think Pickford has an opportunity mm -hmm. to challenge Joe for that. But I think if Joe comes in and, and has a good season at West Ham, then he's still the number one. Plenty more on this surely on tomorrow's show. ESPN FC, check your local listings where to find us. See you then. Major League Soccer returns to our airwaves Friday night from Central Florida. It's Orlando City and Atlanta United. Couple teams above the playoff line in the Eastern Conference, so should be a pretty good one there. Speaking of MLS, the league has finalized its all-star roster ahead of a showdown with Real Madrid on August 2nd in Chicago. Firehead coach Felko Panovic, he'll be in charge, chose his 11 players. And then the commissioner, Don Garber, selecting Kellen Acosta and Dom Dwyer to Major League Soccer's Midsummer Classic. For more on the MLS All-Star Game, we go to Hercules Gomez, who joins us from Philadelphia. Look, Herc, when it comes to All-Star Games, nobody cares about who makes the team. They all want to talk about the snubs. Who are your top snubs, guys left off this year's All-Star team? Well, my top two snubs are both actually on the same team, Kansas City, Sporting Kansas City players. Ike Oparo, who's having a career year, for my money's worth, the best MLS defender to date. And when you're talking about the best American goalkeeper, it's not Tim Howard, it's not Brad Guzan, it's Tim Melia. I cannot see, I can't fathom how these two are not on the All-Star list, two of the better players this year in Major League Soccer. And with those guys leading the charge, Sporting Kansas City right now first place in the Western Conference. Herc is in Philadelphia, though, for the Gold Cup as we take a look at the bracket on Wednesday, Costa Rica, Panama, United States, El Salvador, then Thursday, Mexico, Honduras, and Jamaica and Canada. Of course, the U.S. getting some pretty important reinforcements ahead of the knockout stage. In come Tim Howard, Jesse Gonzalez, Michael Bradley, Darlington Nagby, Josie Altador, and Clint Dempsey. Herc, I just read off the list. Of those six guys, who do you think is the most important to Bruce Arena and this team as they hit the elimination stage of this tournament? Without a doubt, it has to be Michael Bradley. You're bringing in leadership, bringing in stability, something that Dax McCarty, Kellen Acosta have struggled with in this Gold Cup. It's an instant impact on and off the field. It's his most important player to date. Michael Bradley has to be the player with the biggest impact to this team. So, Herc, the U.S. reloads with all these in reinforcements. On the other side of things, Mexico chose not to. Now, originally, Juan Carlos Osorio said, look, I'm happy with the team as it is. Now some reports, though, coming out of Mexico that he actually tried to bring some guys in only to have their club say, nope, not for this tournament. What's going on? It seems like a little bit of sabotage almost of the Colombian head coach. I don't know about sabotage, but there certainly seems to be a disconnect between the Mexican national team coach and the rest of the clubs. They won't allow these players to play. Oribe Peralta was mentioned as one of the players, the same with Jurgen Dam. They both denied. So, you, or, so Mexico now heading into this Gold Cup next final right phase with no reinforcements. They're going to struggle. They, they haven't had that typical nine player uh, playing for them. All types of systems, no rhythm. He's definitely under the gun. All right, thank you very much, Herc. I'll see you in a few hours in Philadelphia. You'll see both of us from the city of brotherly love on tomorrow's show, ESPN FC on ESPN 2, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up, the answer to the question you've all been asking. What's going on with the Scottish Kenny Powers? That's next on ESPN FC. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. Bill and Owen, congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Guys, we have had massive, important, breaking news stories in the world of football this week. But the biggest story on this show 
has been Craig Berlino's god-awful sunglasses. So let's get an explanation from the man himself, joined by Dan Thomas in Los Angeles. Thank you very much, Seb. One thing has been very noticeable, hasn't it, throughout our trip here in L.A., and that is I those. I don't get it. Which you don't, did you lose a bet? What happened? No, I, 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 two cheap pairs, obviously. No, cheap? I, what a yes. shock. I don't, well, you know I don't spend. A black pair, pure black, and a white pair. And I said to the, the wife, I says, <laughs> what looks best? And she said, the white ones. I don't think the black ones would be much better, though. They just look... Well, what, what, what am I supposed to wear? Well, nice sunglasses. These are. Nice aviators, something that, that, they that are. looks so strange. They're not uh, strange. Uh, let's talk about the social media, of course, have had Ugh. a lot to say about it. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Powers, I, uh, people are suggesting. I have it. no clue who right, Kenny look, look, let Powers me show is. You. Look, look, this is Kenny Powers. Look, there he is. Yeah. Good looking He's guy, isn't he? down. He's a great looking guy. Give you a mullet and I think you get it. Well, it's grown back. Uh, and Seb yesterday suggested Edgar Davids. Seb, he's been watching too much Gold Cup. Uh, a lot I mean, of... are we really having a discussion about whether I look like Edgar Davids or not? Is that where we are? Is that where we are? Can the season not start? Please. It's, it's, it is. Uh, people are suggesting, are you going to write any sort of fashion blog as well? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, uh, there's a lot of fashionistas out there, is there? Yeah, and you can lead them. You can show them the light. This is the casual look. This, yep. this is the, I'm in LA. Right. I'm, I'm hanging out with the young, the kids at UCLA. This is the look. I can't help it if people can't keep up. So they're here to stay? I'll be wearing these in Bristol, Connecticut, in the studio, and my next appearance, guaranteed, whether the boss likes it or not. There we go. Back to you in the studio. Craig Burley, they're blaming his wife. you got to take some accountability, no? Well, if his wife said they're good glasses, he needs to divorce her pretty quickly, <laughs> I've got to say. They are horrible glasses. And he reminds me a bit of The Fly. Do you remember that film, The Fly? Uh, yes, yes. Some look there. What do you think, Casey? Yeah, he's, he's doing his best to channel his inner Bono. His, uh, <laughs> there's, there's just... There, I, I'm, Maybe it's just to cover the glare off that shirt he's wearing as well. I mean, that's... Well, I, it's all over. It's just been not, an interesting good, week for Mr. Look. Burley. Not let's a good put look. it that way. I couldn't decide what was more disturbing, the thought of him as a fashion icon or the thought of Craig Burley in a mullet. Scary either way. For Casey, bravo, I'm Sebastian. Thanks for watching. Welcome into ESPN FC Extra Time. Hashtag FC Extra Time. If you want to get us your questions, Casey Keller, Stuart Robson, Sebastian Salazar, Julian Laurent. We'll hear from him in just a little bit. The first question here, though, a little bit of a housekeeping item. Oh, Black Stallion, a good Twitter handle, just released the podcast daily. We do release the podcast daily. You can find it at ESPNFC.com. If you can't find it, I encourage you to either hit Stuart up on Twitter or email Casey at Casey.KellerHotmail.net. You were worried I was going to give you a real email address. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you know you can find the podcast every day. Here's a good question. Can Chelsea sign Morata before the start of the season? And how likely is Alexis Sanchez going to Chelsea? You want to handle that one? I don't think Alexis Sanchez will go to Chelsea. I don't think okay. Arsenal will let him go there. Uh, Morata, I think, would be a fantastic sign. And I think he could go to Chelsea. And that would be a little bit the icing on the cake. Antonio Conte now signed a new contract. He might be happier if he gets Morata because things haven't gone his way in the summer. Morata, Sanchez, who would you prefer? I think they'd be happy with either. But I agree with Stuart. I don't think Arsenal's going to let him go to Chelsea. I think they did a... Uh, a favor in the other direction mm. by allowing Peter Cech to go to Arsenal, yeah, yeah. But, I, but I don't think that favor is going the other direction. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Julian, uh, how likely is it that Chelsea do indeed sign Alvaro Morata? I think it's very likely, and I think I agree with the boys. It would be a, a perfect signing, perfect fit for Conte's team and the way Conte uh, and Chelsea are playing, really. And Conte knows him very well. Obviously, the money I don't think will be an issue, even if we're talking 80 or 90 million. Uh, euros or pound depending because that's the money they were ready to pay for Lukaku for example and that's the money you need to pay if you want a striker of the calibre of Alvaro Morata I think he wants to leave um, Real Madrid obviously but you know a club like AC Milan is also very interested and I think Chelsea will have to put a bit of a fight to get him Julian between Romelu Lukaku and Alvaro Morata who do you rate higher because it seems as though when Chelsea had their choice it would have been Lukaku I'm a big Morata fan, though. I just love him. I love the touch. And for me, he has a much better touch than, than Lukaku. Um, I just love his movement off the ball, especially. And I just think he's a, it would be a wonderful signing for Chelsea. All right, next up on our questions. Uh, right now, Arsenal are said to be selling up to eight players to sign Lamar for £80 million. Is he worth it? 
or should they go get Riyad Mahrez? I'll hear from you guys in a second, but I want to get Jules' answer here first. I mean, 80 million for, for Thomas Lemar, as much as I love him, and not just because he's French, but because he's awesome. I think that's a, a far too much money for him, though. Uh, but that's, that's the strategy that Monaco is using. They're overvaluing him because they don't want him to go. They want to keep him because it would be easier than to keep Kylian Mbappé at the club as well. And I, and I really believe Monaco don't think anyone is going to pay that much money for Thomas Lemar. I think they're probably right. And I think Arsenal are going to come back with another bid, but nothing higher than £50 million. Pounds. This would suggest that Arsenal is willing to spend some rather large cash. You buying it? Yes, I think uh, they can spend the cash. Uh, you mentioned Mares there, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think Riyad Mares would be a great signing for Arsenal. You know, he's a player that has proved himself in the Premier League over the last couple. He didn't have a great season last yeah. year, but the season before he was absolutely outstanding. And I think he can reproduce that sort of form if he gets a move to a bigger club, and Arsenal would be that bigger club. You like the idea of Mares at uh, Arsenal? I think Mars makes sense. Uh, I think he needs to leave Leicester. I think he needs a, a challenge. I think he needed that challenge last year, and, and, and unfortunately for, for Leicester, they saw that. Uh, so I think it makes sense for Arsenal. I, I think they also need to sign a couple other players, and if it means they need to get rid of some players first. And to, they certainly do need sign. to get rid of some players as well, yeah, Arsenal, correct. don't they? They need, they need to kind of freshen things up, yeah. and we talked about that. Uh, Julien, how do you rate Riyad Mars? Was it a flash in the pan with Leicester City, or is there more there? No, I think the talent is there. There's, there's no problem. I think the consistency, and we've seen that over the last two seasons, which one is the real marriage? Is it the one of the, the year they won the league, or is it the one last season who struggled a bit more in a team that struggled as well? And, you know, if he signs for Arsenal and Arsenal expects him to carry the team forward, can he do that? Can he not do that? I'm not sure. Again, he's a Paris kid, so I, I love him, obviously, I do. And I would love him at Arsenal. But Lemar is younger. Lemar defends, defends more, runs more, has a different uh, style of playing that maybe suits Arsenal a bit more because Mares and Ozil together. I'm not so sure. Lemar and Ozil together, I'm far more convinced with that. So it'll be interesting. It's, it's, it's a little different price tag as well. Mm. I mean, I think they'd be able to get Mares a little bit cheaper at this point in time. And, and, and if you can kind of, you've seen it a, a million times, you got to kind of get that one signing kind of over the hurdle and then get everything else to fall into place and couldn't they get Mares and then that kind of moves things in a direction and you know but Arsenal needs something and they need something quickly. Julian now where do you suppose Riyad Mahrez actually ends up next year we've heard rumors of a link to Roma where do you where do you see it? Yeah I think Roma are probably leading the race to sign Riyad right now I think he would be very tempted to go to Italy and, and to Roma as well, where, where the project is, is, is really good, you know, they're, they're doing great things and over there. There's obviously a new young manager in Di Francesco there and, and clearly Di Francesco really wants Mares. So it'd be interesting to see what he does. But, but right now, I, I believe Arsenal haven't made any offer for Mares. I think, you know, his age might be a bit of an issue as well, depending on how much Leicester are asking for, for, for him. So, again, right now, I think it's more likely for him to go to Roma than to go to Arsenal. All right, as we follow all of these stories, make sure to check us out on tomorrow's show, Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can catch us on ESPN2. We'll see you then.